Praise the Lord. We have a good crowd today. It always seems like you have a bigger crowd and then the youth leave, you know, but uh, praise the Lord. We're going to have a good time. Good to see you all tonight. I'm going to go old school on you today because my iPad uh, didn't want to uh, work with me. And so I, I went to the printer. You know, it works. It's run, run out of batteries, you know, it'll be all right. Praise the Lord. So if the sermon gets real long, you know, I won't have any battery issues. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You guys uh, happy to be in church tonight? Yes. I can see some smiles. Lindsay and Boutique are here tonight, you know, all the way from Haiti. I mean, I think they traveled the furthest to get here tonight. And so, <laughs> praise the Lord, good to have you guys with us. They're, they're part of our church, you know, they're, they're just uh, a little bit uh, distant a lot of times, but praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to talk to you tonight about some of this. How many of you were here last Wednesday night? So I know uh, quite a few of you were here. Okay, I'm scanning the crowd, keep your... Yes, okay, so I talked about the power of your words. <clears throat> it's, um, it's an extremely important subject. Uh, and as when you start to look into the power of words, the power of the words of God, you know, how he accomplishes things and stuff like that, you realize that, wow, uh, words are important. And, uh, and I need to, to get a grip on my lip, so to speak. You know, I need to watch what I say. And, uh, uh, and make sure that I release the right kind of words, you know, over my family, over my loved ones, over my future, you know, and, uh, and don't take thoughts that are unproductive, you know, because, uh, you know, we have an adversary, adversary, you know, the devil, and, and he knows, you know, the thing is people, you know, the devil is not, you know, he just, he just has learned over however long he has been around, he has seen how God does things, and he's seen how his children accomplish great things. And he has also figured out how to get in there and trick them because he is a master deceiver, right? That's what he does. You know, we're going to see him, you know, at the end we're going to see him and we're going to, you know, it's like, it's this the one who deceived the nations? You know, and so, but he, what he does is that he uses your authority against you. What I mean by that, well, you have great authority with your words, so he will plant thoughts in there. Thoughts. You know, this isn't working out, you know. Your spouse is so difficult, this will never work out, you know, and, 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 and they're never going to change. He wants, you to put, he wants to put that in your mouth that it's never going to change. It's just going to stay this way. I'm not going to get out of this rut. You know, and so, so he uses you know, your authority against you if you will fall for his deception. But we don't have to fall for his deception, but it's, it's very easy to do. And actually, it's almost like default. <clears throat> if you don't put the word of God in you, if you don't plant that in your heart, if you don't renew your mind, your default will be to listen to the accuser. The accuser of the brethren, that's what the Bible calls him. And so if you have a thought that is against one of your, you know, your, your, your fellow people, you know, that you hang around and, and it's just like, and it's not good, well then, it's probably a thought from the accuser and you should probably not cooperate with him. You know, and so I like to, to, to look at it that way because if you look at it that way, it's like, I'm not going to be on your, I'm not on your team. I'm on the opposing team. I am not going to team up with you. You know, and that's why, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 8, you know, we have that in the Amplified. We have this handout that we gave, you know, to everyone. And one of the things that it says in there is that, you know, uh, love uh, never thinks ill of anyone, always thinks the best of every person. That's what love does. And that's what I choose to do. We have to choose to do that. So anyhow, you know, so we're going to talk about the power of words and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat some of the things because what I have realized is that, you know, you ask people, you know, so how was the sermon? Or I've been, been, I've, I've been there myself. It's like, oh, it's great. It's a great sermon. What they talk about. Well, I don't remember, but it was a great sermon. Right? And so, so it's not enough to just hear it once. You, you, we we kind of have to have some repetition. You know, that's how you learned in school. You know, you didn't learn the multiplication table just the first day and then it stuck. If you do, then God bless you. But 
For most people, you have to hear it again and hear it again and you hear it again. You know, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. He said that, you know, I planted Apollos, which was another guy that he had with him. He watered, he said, but God gave the increase. And so there's a planting process. You know, do you hear the word the first time? You might even get excited about it. You know, but if you don't hear it again, there's a good chance that it will not take root in your heart and you will probably not put it into practice. Right. And so, you know, that's why Brother Hagen, you know, Kenneth E. Hagen, he was the one who founded the Bible school that pastor went to and that I went to like decades later. But, you know, he he would he would repeat himself again and again and again and again. And he would even come in. And you've heard me say this before. He would come in and he would just preach the same sermon the next day with the same illustrations. He says, well, you guys didn't get it. And so here we go. <laughs> and if you're not careful, you will not value that, and you will just start to just disregard. Well, I've heard that before, right? But I'm telling you, if, if there's something that you think that you've heard before, but, but it's not producing in your life, well, then you probably are not putting it into practice. And it's probably not at the forefront of your mind when you need it to be. And so that's why you have to hear it again and again and again. That's why, you know, we have the gospel according to Matthew and the gospel according to Mark and Luke and John. You know, if you didn't get it from Matthew, there's a chance you might get it from Mark, Luke, or John, right? At least three of them are very similar. John is a little different. But anyhow, you know, God knows that we need to hear stuff again and again and again and again. That Hagen, or Kenneth e. Hagen said it this way. He says, your mind does not stay renewed any longer than your hair stays combed. And when you got up this morning, you know, someone's like, Rusty, don't have to worry about that. But I had to say that. Anyhow. <laughs> but, you know, it's you probably, it's not like a Hallmark movie where you wake up and everything's perfect. Right? And so that's the same thing with you renewing your mind according to what the Bible says. And so that's why I'm going to talk more about words today. And I'm probably going to repeat some of the things that I said last Wednesday. Why? Because we all need it. You know, if I, if I sit down and I wonder what all I said last Wednesday, I'm sure you wondered the same thing. You know, it's <laughs> we're all human beings, but we have to realize how, how these things work so we can get with it, you know, and so we can get, get good at using our words properly because they're so powerful. You know, when Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says, you know, uh, our words have the power over life and death, then that's a pretty serious thing, wouldn't you say? Yes. Right? So if, you're, if your words can produce life or your words can produce death, well, that's a big deal, right? Then your words will affect your spouse. Your words will affect your children. Your words will affect the people that you are around. And their words will affect you. You don't, have to, you don't have to receive what people say about you, you know, because you might know better. It's like, well, I'm not what they say I am. I'm what God says I am. But we need to watch what we say. And, you know, Dr. John Gi Cho, he was, you know, he's in heaven now, but he was a pastor of, of the largest church in South Korea, and he had like seven, 800,000 members, maybe up to a million at some point. And he said that he sat down with a, with a neurosurgeon and they had a meal together. And the neurosurgeon said that I've made a new, new discovery. And, and Cho said, well, what's this new discovery? Well, he says that the speech center in the brain, he says, controls the whole body. And so he said it's so much so that if somebody says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm weak, you know, I'm, 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 I don't feel well, you know, that the body starts to respond to that. The body starts to, he says, if people say, well, you know, I just, you know, it, it'll get to the point that if you say that you won't live a long time, you won't live a long time. And I've seen this in people that were near and dear to my heart. I've seen their words produce. And in one instance, the person went home to be with the Lord way before that person had to. And so, so our words are so, so important and, you know, and he said, you know, uh, Dr. Cho said, well, I know that. 
You know, he says, I've known that for a long time. He says, how have you known? It's, been, it's a new discovery we've just made. What he said, he said, I, I heard it from Dr. James. You know, chapter 3, in the, you know, James chapter 3 in the Bible. And he says that, for you all stumble in many things. This is James 3, verse 2. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so the tongue is, a little member and boasts great things. And so, you know, we've probably read this, all of us, at some point in the Bible, but I don't think that it has actually registered as it needs to register. You know, that our, 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 our tongue, what we say, can actually control our whole body. And when you look into the Word, it'll control even more than that. It'll actually put up the parameters of your life and what God is able to do in your life for you and through you. And so why is this? And I, I'm just going to go through some, some of the basics here because we need to get this settled in our hearts so that we put it into practice. You know, it's the word that you, you do something with. It's the word that you put into practice that's going to produce something for you, right? And this has stolen so much. From, I'm going to get into that later. But it says people's words, in many instances, steal more than they give. So anyhow, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, you know, you go back to the book of beginnings and you'll see a lot of principle. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, of the birds of the air, and of every living thing that moves on the earth. So according to Genesis 1, 26 through 28, man must be by design a whole lot like God. Wouldn't you say? If he made man in his own image, in his own likeness, we must be a lot like God. And how did God change the scenery in Genesis chapter 1? It's not a trick question. God said, and it was. God said, and it was. God said, and it was. And so as his child, as his children, we work a lot like what he does. And people are like, well, he is God. Well... Yes, he is, but you are made just like him, just like him, hallelujah. And so I want to go to Romans chapter 4. You might need some, you know, some of you scholars might need some New Testament scripture, you know, so it's like, well, that's Old Testament, and it's like, I don't know. Well, Romans chapter 4, you know, this is Paul. He wrote over half the New Testament, you know, he had, he had revelation of what actually happened on the cross, you know, in the spirit. You know, Paul's revelation is like an x-ray. You know, you saw what happened underneath the surface. You know, the gospels show you what Jesus did, you know, his works and stuff like in the open. But, but Paul's revelation was more than that. You know, Paul's revelation, some, somebody said that it's, it's, it's the advanced teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there were some things that Jesus couldn't even say or, or communicate to, to the disciples until after they were born again. So then in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, I'm going to read it out the ESV because it is clearer, I think, than the King James. Romans 4 verse 17 says, As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So that's how God operates. He calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hallelujah. So God operates this way. And the thing is that you operate this way whether you realize it or not. Hallelujah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about 
what God does with his words. Because you kind of operate the same way, so we're going to see how, how, how this go, go together. And so, God calls things into existence using words. And then in Hebrews chapter 1, I'm going to read through verses 1 through 3, and see another thing that God does with his words. I'm going to read this out of the ESV as well. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The word went forth in the beginning. And the word of God is what still keeps everything in place. So that's what you have, you know, spring, summer, all these things you have night and day. You know, all the sun and the moon and the stars and everything is in place. All the whole universe is in place and it's kept there by the word of God. Isn't that interesting? His word was sent and still it keeps it in place. God's words never change. Aren't you glad that God doesn't say things just, you know, just for fun? And just, you know, let's see how that works. No, he does everything with, with uh, purpose and he never does anything without wanting to accomplish something with it. Another thing that Jesus, God does with his words, and you know, this is going to be Jesus. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 14. And, um, you know, this is after, you know, he fed the 5,000. And I'm going to continue reading out of the ESV, Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. <clears throat> Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening, when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? When he got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of of God. God will empower you with his word. Just the word come was enough to empower Peter to walk on the water. You know, this will help you when you start putting this together and you start to see what God says about you in his word. Come was enough for him to walk on the water. And has any of you walked on the water? I haven't done it here lately. It's I've never done it. <laughs> God's words are also life, and they're also spirit. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. If you remember in John chapter 4, when uh, Jesus was talking at the woman at the well, he said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So if the words of God are spirit and they're truth, he puts something of himself in his words. And that, that makes it kind of, I'm just, when I started to see the power of words and what God does with words, how he will, he will, he will send his word. He sent his word and healed them. He said in Psalm 107, verse 20. You know, he, he, 
he empowers people with his words. And so when I receive his words, as if God speaks to me, there's an empowerment there. And I can receive whatever he sent for me to receive. And on that note, go to Isaiah chapter 55. This talks about the words of God. And God never does anything without great purpose. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse, verse 10. It says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, make it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God will send his word to produce something. He never say, say anything without having purpose for it to produce or do something. And that makes this book very interesting to me. Because this book is God speaking to me and you. And if we will receive the word, then the word will produce in our lives. And as a little case study, let's look at the purpose of the gospel, the good news. You know, the gospel is, it, we preach the gospel so people can be born again, right? John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that all through him <clears throat> might be saved. Hallelujah. I just jumped... Uh, page and I don't know where my right one is but anyhow it doesn't matter because we're going to go to uh, Romans chapter 10 it talks about you know how you get saved and saved in the Greek it means more than just you going to heaven it means safety preservation deliverance and healing and to make whole that's what salvation means and so we're talking about the words of God and what they're able to do for you. And I'm going to talk about how you put this into practice in your own life because that's, that's the interesting part here. And so in Romans chapter 10 and verse 8, he says, What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so the word is sent that Jesus took care of the sin problem. The word is sent that Jesus died for you. He took the penalty for your sin. He rose again for you so that you could be saved, right? And so how does this become activated in your life? Well, you have to believe that in your heart, but that's not enough. You actually have to assent to it. You have to agree with your mouth that Jesus is now your Lord, right? So it wasn't enough that it was just done and that the word was sent. You actually had to receive the word and confess with your mouth. And confession means to assent or to acknowledge, hallelujah, it is you acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And when you do that, then you're translated out from underneath the authority of darkness into the kingdom of God, just with one confession of your mouth. And that's pretty powerful. And the thing is that all of the other things that God has promised you in his word, had he has sent his word to produce in your life, then you will have to not just believe it in your heart, but you're going to have to agree with it with your mouth. Because of the power of your words, because your words is what's going to make a difference in your life. And so many people think that, well, you know, I believe in God. Well, even the demons, the word says, believe in God and tremble. But unless you confess the lordship of Jesus, you won't be saved. Because you have to release the authority over your life with your mouth. Hallelujah. And I think that one of the most 
best 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 ways I've seen this actually is is in First Corinthians chapter eleven when it talks about communion. And let's go there. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse twenty three. And hope this is not too many scriptures for you to follow me, but I'm trying to just show you that this is in the scripture everywhere. The power of your words and, 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 and the need for you to move your mouth on your behalf and on behalf of your family in a positive way. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And I started, I looked up this word proclaim, and it actually, it's the word promulgate in English. I was like, I didn't know what that meant. But it means to put a law or decree into effect by official proclamation. And so the thing is, you know, when it comes to the lordship of Jesus, that's why it's so important for you to, to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. You know, because the thing is that you don't just acknowledge it to you or to the person you're talking to, talking to. You know, you need to declare it to the devil and his gang that, you know what, I have changed my allegiance. I'm no longer under your authority. Now Jesus is Lord. I have made Jesus my Lord and Savior, and I want every demon in hell to know. I want all the holy angels to know, and I want you to know, Lord, that you are my Lord and my Savior. I want God to know. I want the Holy Spirit to know that Jesus is my Lord. And the thing is, when you start to proclaim those things, then the devil's like, oh, I might not have as much authority there anymore. Because they're starting to, to, to use their authority that is theirs now because they're in the kingdom of God. And there's something about you opening your mouth to declare who's Lord. Because when you say that Jesus is Lord, you say a whole lot of things. You know, it says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, it says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life, Zoe, in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That law comes into effect when you speak the word. When you release your words as far as who's Lord in your life, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has set you free from the law of sin and death comes into effect. And it will drive out fear. It will drive out all of the works of the enemy from your sphere. If you give in to oppression, if you give in to feelings, if you knew what you gave in to, you would throw up. Because there's demonic influences around you being down. It's not okay for a Christian to give in to, to, to depression. Depression's from hell. Depression is from hell. And it is spiritual influences that is trying to rule your life. If you're not a Christian, you don't have any authority. But if you're a Christian, you can tell that stuff to pack its bag bags and get out of your house. You need to speak not just over your, you need to plead the blood of your family. You need, to, you need to say that, you know what, the blood of Jesus, it brought me out. Just like the Israelites, go and see what the type of the blood did for them. In Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, it brought them out with silver, silver and gold and was not one feeble person among their tribes. And there were millions of people. Now that's a miracle. And that's what, what the type of the blood of Jesus would do for them. Well, you need to say that. The Lord has brought me out because of the blood. He qualified me for his best blessing because of the blood of Jesus. I declare for me in my house, we're blessed by God. There needs to be a declaration out of your mouth Regarding what God has done for you. The same thing. Because Jesus died for everybody. Did you know that? He died for the sins of the world. When they 
if somebody shows up in hell, it's not because of their sins. It's because they didn't receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The, the worst sinner, the absolute worst one, his sins have been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Jesus took the penalty for that person not to go to hell. But if they will not receive what Jesus did for them and declare that Jesus is Lord, I receive what he did, then they'll be eternally lost. And so when you talk to people that are around you that don't know Jesus, whatever, it's just like you don't have to tell them that they're a sinner. They know. Or they might be oblivious to it. But when you start to talk to them about Jesus, there's something that happens. Because the Holy Spirit comes. He's the one who convicts of sin. He's the one who reveals to them that they need Jesus. But you need to tell them that you, you, won't, go, you, you won't go to hell because of your sins. The only thing that can, 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 can get anybody to hell is because they do not receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and read it, and you'll see it's there. You know, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, this is a very familiar scripture for many, many of you, I think, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, so by what Jesus did, right, and by the word of their testimony. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. You need to keep speaking the word over your life. You need to keep speaking what God has done for you. You need to keep speaking who you are now because of what Jesus did for you. There's been nothing in my life that has helped me more. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will help you grow in faith like you confessing what Jesus has done for you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God. You know, when, you're, when, you, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior on the inside, you're a brand new creature. Brand new person on the inside. You actually have the nature and the ability of Almighty God. You know, if you're in school, you might want to start saying that, thank you, Father, that I have received life, your life, Zoe. And that life quickens me, spirit, soul, and body. It actually gives me the ability to learn fast. You know, David and his friends were ten times wiser than Pharaoh's magicians and wise men, astrologers, whatever they were. Ten times what can we accomplish as being born again, being filled with the life of God, being partakers of his divine nature? Peter talks about that. We become partakers of the divine nature. Actually, it's been one scripture that I have. You can't wear out a scripture, but I've tried. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 5 through 9. He says that I was enriched, you know, Paul's talking to the Corinthians, he says, you were enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of, your, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It says that you were enriched, enriched by him. You were given his nature and his ability. The day you were born again, the day that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, that was the day you received Jesus. You know, one, one translation says you became like Jesus in ability to teach and an ability to learn. How about that? You think Jesus was able to, 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 to learn, to, 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 dude, he Knew the scriptures so much so that the Pharisees were like, how can this man know the scriptures like this? And so there's ability in you to learn, to understand, to develop. I mean, Brother Hagin was talking about this. You know, he, he 
you know, he didn't know what he was doing. He said, sometimes, you know, the Lord will just help you and you don't even know what you're doing. So he started, you know, you know John chapter 1. Let's go there real quick. Because this will help you. This is the stuff that needs to come out of your mouth. Instead of us like, you know, I think it was Brother Hagin who also said, you know, he says, the man who said he couldn't do it and the man who said he, he can do it, he says they're both right. The guy who said he can't do it, he won't be able to do it, but the guy who, guy who says he can do it, he'll be able to do it. And so in John chapter 1, it's talking about the Word, talking about Jesus. He was the Word manifest in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the thing is that when you receive Jesus, you know, he said, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So when you receive Jesus, you received God's kind of life. You know, that life... You know, Brother Hagin said this, you can, you can say it like this. He said, that, he said that that life was the development of men. If you will start to talk like this, you, if you will start to agree with the word and say, you know what, I have the life of God in me. Thank you, Father, that you gave me life. And in that life is ability to do all you need to do in grand style. You know, I remember when I started taking flight training, you know, first of all, I didn't even think I could. Started ha hanging around Yoder, you know, he was a pilot, and some other friends of mine were pilots, and I, I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe I can do this. And I started listening to, to, to Keith Moore. He had a series on the wisdom of God. You know, the Word of God will give you faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It will impart things to you from heaven. God put something of himself in his word. You know, he put life that was in himself in the words of the gospel. So when you received that, it produced in you eternal life. You know, Peter talks about that. He said that, he said that you're born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed by the word of God. By the word of God. And so in you is life. You have abilities that maybe you haven't tapped into yet, but you can and so I started getting faith for it because I was working offshore at the time. And, and, uh, and uh, I had a cabin, you know, and you only work 12 hours. So what are you going to do with the rest of the time? You know, you can't sleep all that time. So I would just listen to a sermon every night. You know, so I had these, you know, we had terrible internet back then. So I would download, you know, this series before I left. And, uh, and uh, or maybe I just set it on the whole day. I can't remember. It's been like forever ago. Anyhow, I was watching these videos, you know, on the wisdom of God. And, and he was talking about wisdom, and he was talking about, you know, all these things. And I started to just believe that I could do this. And, and it just, it just kind of manifested in this whole pilot thing, because I was like, that's something that I... For me, it was a faith project, because it had seemed so far away. You know, in, I grew up in Norway, and there it was just expensive. And it's just like, so I just ne it was never on my radar, so to speak. But I, I started getting faith for this, and then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to... And I was impressed to ask for time off. And so I asked for like every other trip I was supposed to work offshore, I asked for it off. And so, so I could, so I, back then I worked five weeks, had five weeks off, five weeks on, five weeks off. And then so now I would have five weeks I would work, and then I would have 15 weeks off. How's that sound? Doesn't that sound great? It was a great year, I'll tell you that. It was a great year. And so, and so, and then I applied for flight school, you know, got the visas I needed to do and stuff like that. And I, I started taking lessons. And, uh, and there was such a grace on me to study. I've never liked school. I was one of the guys who was just sit there at the, at the desk and look outside. Think about all the stuff I could do out there. The sun is shining. I am wasting my life. What am I doing here? And I would, you know, so that's kind of how I always was. I'd rather be out in my boat fishing and doing, you know, anything else. And so, um, yeah, I did have a little boat. It was a 10-foot little boat with a 9 Point nine horsepower Yamaha, I think it was, that I did something to, so I got 14 horsepower out of it. Anyhow, it's a, uh, but uh, 
So, but there was such a grace on me to study. I would sit, you know, I, I, I like coffee, so I would just, you know, sit down at Starbucks and I would just drink coffee all day and study. It was great. And so I would sit for like eight hours a day. You know, most people don't like to study that long. I loved it. And I devoured these books and I just, I learned about aerodynamics, I learned about weather, and I was just like, this is so fun. And I ended up you know, just getting my private, and then I got my instrument, and then I got my commercial, and then I got my multi-engine. I was like, if I hadn't watched, I would have ended up in the airlines a long time ago because I love fly. But, but, but the, the cool thing is that I was never that good, you know, I didn't have super great grades in school, but I had 100% on all of my written tests when it came to flying because there was faith I can do this. And so, so, so I started studying, and listen to this. You know, because when you first start, you know, you're, you're supposed to, okay, you're supposed to fly the plane, you're supposed to talk on the radio, you're supposed to think of where you are, you know, so you're looking at all these instruments and it's like somebody's calling, it's like, you missed that, I missed that call, you know, and so you ought to know what I'm talking about. And so, so it takes a while for you to think as a pilot, to see yourself as a pilot. And after a while, all these things start to become second nature. Because now you know how to respond on the radio. You know what to listen for. And now you know the different types of airspace, and you start to know the airplane. You know, and so, so you learn your scan, and, you, you know, you, and first it's, it's visual reference, so you, you, know, you look outside as well as your instruments, you know. And then, you know, you go on, to start to just go to instrument training just so you can fly, you know, when there's no visual reference. And now you really need to pay attention and know what you're doing. And you need to be kind of ahead of the game because it's not like you can just park on the side of the road and say, like, okay, let me look at where I'm at now. Right? So you need to be, you need to be ahead, of it, ahead of the game. And so you need to know where you're going. And so, so, so to say this, to bring this back to what we're talking about when it comes to the things of God. You know, it, it, it takes a while from when you're just born again to start to, to see yourself as a Christian. Somebody that has the life of God in them. You know, and you start to understand how to respond with your mouth to certain situations. Does this make sense? It takes a little bit of time but if you don't spend time studying, if you don't take time to find out how these things work, if you don't take time in the presence of the Lord, and you, just, and you realize that, that you know, there, there, there's, there's, there's three parts to the God. is God, the Father, God, the Son, and then there's the Holy Spirit who's actually been sent to help you. It's like your, your private flight instructor. He's with you all the time. But most people don't take advantage of him. You remember Jesus talked about him. He said, it's to your advantage that I go away because if I don't go away, the helper will not come. And so, so, so having the Holy Spirit in you to help you navigate life is actually better than Jesus being in the earth. Because if, if it was just Jesus in the earth, there would be a long line outside the temple in Jerusalem, wherever he would be. And so, so but he's here to help you. And that's, why I was, that's probably why I was thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter 2 when I was preparing today. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Dude, it's almost 8 o'clock. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Dude. That's, uh, I'm Norwegian. Bear with me. That's, uh, that's my best I can do right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10. <laughs> Glory be to God. Mm, let me see. No, let's, let's back up for a little bit here. <clears throat> you know, Paul, and, and this, this will help some of you. In verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And sometimes, you know, when you just stop right there, sometimes when you're, if you're new to the things of God, it might seem less like a mystery. Because it seems hard to understand. You know, because it's so unfamiliar to you. Right? And so we'll keep on speaking here. No, keep on reading. Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew what they did, they would have never put Jesus on that cross. Because he reproduced himself in the millions. 
Anyhow, verse 9, but as it is written, I has not seen or ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He is there to reveal to you what God has done for you. And there's, there's much we could say, you know, about the power of words and, and, and the work of the Holy Ghost. But one thing I want to mention to you is that, you know, Jesus in Acts chapter 1, you know, he says, and this, 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 will, this, will, this will help you in regards to what we've said and the work of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 1, let's go there real quick. And verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them. So this was not a suggestion, right? He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now go to chapter 2, verse 1, where this actually came to pass. Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so Jesus said, don't go until you receive the Holy Spirit. And then, you know, you're baptized in the Holy Ghost and, and, and you start speaking in other tongues. Why is this speaking so important? Tongues as a fire was put upon each and every one of them. Why is this speaking so important? Why well, it is because God can do nothing in the earth except doing it through man. Because we were given, and this is like getting into a whole different aspect of the teaching, but, but he has forever linked himself to man. And if he's going to do anything in the earth, it's going to have to happen through mankind. Because he gave us the authority on the earth. And so he gave us the Holy Spirit. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he talks about this. He said that you speak to God. And you speak mysteries. But you're speaking. You're releasing words. You're releasing words. Inspired by the Spirit of God who knows everything. He knows everything about your future. He knows everything about what you need. But words need to be uttered. Words need to be spoken. Because authority is released through words. And whether you realize it or not, when you speak in other tongues, you release words regarding your future. You release words regarding your family. And you find yourself in a place where you're speaking straight from heaven. And it, it needs to bypass your head because there's a lot of limitations there uh, regarding what God can do for you. So it's, 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 it's great help that God has given us so that he can accomplish his great purpose for our lives. And so if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you need to use it. And if you haven't, then you need to. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. He says that we don't always know how to pray as we ought. It doesn't say we don't know how to pray. But sometimes you need to pray for things that you don't even need you know. No, you need. <laughs> 
and he'll help you. He'll help you navigate life well. Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes. Pray. We're at 804. I have to stop this at some point. Father, we thank you so much for your amazing grace. Father, I ask that you will help each and every one here to understand the power of their words so that their words will be words of life. Father, so that they will agree with what you say in your word regarding what you've done for them and what you want to do through them. Father, words, you said it yourself in your word, Father, that they are, <laughs> they produce life or death. And I know sometimes, Father, we've even said things and, and we, have, we have kept you from moving in our lives. And we have opened the doors for the enemy to, to work in areas that we shouldn't have opened. So, Father, we ask you to forgive us for those times. And we ask you, Father, to help us to put a guard on our mouth and to, to help us to listen to your promptings. And Father, as we put our nose in the Bible, Father, we ask that you will continue to reveal to us, Father, the importance of words and what we need to speak of our families, Father. Because we know, Father, that our words that we speak, they, they, they have the same effect as your words, Father, that you speak. They frame our world and they keep things in place. Hallelujah. And Father, as I'm praying now, remember, Father, that Reinhard Bonnke said that his life changed when you told him that my words in your mouth is as powerful as my words in my mouth. And he said it changed his ministry. And Father, as we understand, start to get a revelation, Father, of the power of our words. Hallelujah, Father. We will start to use them more and more effectively, Father. And make sure that what we speak is what you impress us on us to speak, Father. That we'll speak what your word says. That we'll say, Father, we're blessed going in. We're blessed going out. Hallelujah. We're above and not beneath. That we have the greater one living inside of us. Hallelujah. That we have wisdom from heaven to deal with any situation. And who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, so we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. And our bodies will serve us well all the days of our lives. We'll say that the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. We shall not want for opportunity. We shall not want for ability. We will never want for money. We will never want for a strong, healthy body because Jesus is Lord. We will fulfill everything you've called us to do in grand style. Then we'll do a victory lap just because we want to. And then we're going to speak blessings over our children and over our children's children. We're going to prophesy over them. We're going to speak words that will stay with them their whole lives. Inspired by the Holy Ghost regarding what you've called them to do. The plans and purposes, Father, that you have. Because by your spirit, Father, we have access. Woo! We have access, Father, to your thoughts, to your plans and your purposes, Father. Hallelujah. And we'll release the right words at the right time, Father, so that you will not be hindered in bringing the blessing, bringing healing, bringing deliverance, bringing freedom. Hallelujah. Words, words, words. Powerful. Glory. The word says, hold fast to the confession of your faith. He you promised is faithful. So I'd like to encourage you, if you've You've spoken the word and it doesn't seem like things are moving as you want to. Well, you keep speaking the word because he's faithful who promised. And keep confessing the word. 
keep meditating on the Word. And that Word, as it is watered, as it's watered, hallelujah, it'll increase to the point that you will tune into the frequency of faith. And it'll be to you, as what Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, that you'll have whatsoever you say, because you believe it in your heart and you speak it with your mouth. Hallelujah. It's vitally important for you to finish your course well, for you to keep the enemy at bay and for you to release angels to do what they're supposed to do on your behalf. Thank you, Father. I ask, Father, that you will absolutely fill us, Father, with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Hallelujah. Being strengthened with all might, according to your glorious power, for all long-suffering and patience with joy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, we were praying before service here today, and you know, I've been praying for, you know, our church and for the people of our church and and you know, this, this here, this subject here of, of words is so important for God to be able to do what He wants to do. And for us to, to start to speak over our lives. And it's, it's, it's vital actually for you to be able to accomplish what God wants you to do. And for you to shut down the enemy. Because he's out to hinder and he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And, you know, many times it's, it's I heard one preacher say this, you know, if we had just whatever we said in church, we would have faith giants everywhere. You know, but it's what are you saying Monday through Saturday? You know, what are the words that are coming out of your mouth regarding your family and regarding your future when the pressure is on? Because the pressure is on during the week. You know, and it's, it's the confession of your mouth that is going to change the scenery. I'm not saying it's everything, but I'm saying that it's a vital part of faith. It's the initial action of faith is for you to move your mouth. Because it's such a powerful thing. And I've seen it in my life. You know, you, you have to hold on. You know, the scripture says, hold, hold on to the confession of your faith. So, so there's somebody trying to get that out of your hand. So you need to keep holding on to what God has promised you. You need to keep on speaking that over your family. You need to keep speaking that over your... I don't care what it looks like. Because faith changes the scenery. It's not moved by what it looks like. Because if you're going to be moved by what, you, what it looks like, you're going to lose every faith battle. Every one of them. Every one of them. But if you will look at what the Bible says, and if you will trust God, that He will watch over His Word to perform it, your life will change. I'm not saying it's going to change overnight, but it will change. You know, faith is not a sprint. This, this life of faith is going to be until you walk through the doors of heaven. You're going to have to walk by faith. You know, it's like if you were stopped by, by circumstances, look at the life of Paul, will you? You know, he was, he, was, he was, you know, moving his way, you know, towards Philippi, we knew. He didn't know it at that time. He tried to go somewhere. The Holy Spirit forbade him. He tried to go somewhere else. The Holy Spirit didn't let him. And then he had this vision in the night. This man of Macedonia, he said, come over and help us. And he's like, well, we decided that's what the Lord wanted us to do. And then they end up in jail. Well, I did what you told me, Lord, and look at this. 
was not what came out of their mouth. Because if you start complaining, you will stay in jail. You will stay bound. I've told my daughter, I said, if you pout, you'll do without. Might as well learn it now. Because the thing is that in, as a Christian, if you pout, you'll do without. But if you will start to rejoice in the Lord your God, if you will start to rejoice in the fact that, you know what, the blood of Jesus has set me free, it's redeemed me from sin and all the effects of it. Actually, the blood of Jesus washes away even the stain of sin. So your, your, your past doesn't have to have any influence on what your future looks like. Did you hear me? Don't let your past determine what your future is going to look like. Don't identify with your past. You identify with what the Bible says. Identify with what he said, and we're going to change the scenery from now on. Because if you let it, your past will be an anchor that you would just drag around. And you wonder why I'm not getting, well, you need to let go of that thing. And move forward into that great life that God has for you. And the thing is that God has so much more. I, I am pretty sure that 99% of Christians have not stepped into a fraction of what God has for them. You know, Brother, Brother Hagin, no, I think it was actually the Lord told Brother Hagin in a vision. Jesus appeared to me and said, most ministers live and die without entering the first phase of their ministry. Most ministers live and die. But I entering to the first thing that God had for them to do. Well, it doesn't have to be that way for you. You start to say out of your mouth, and I say this all the time, I will fulfill everything that God has called me to do in grand style. I'm not doing it in my strength. I'm doing it in His you know, Paul said that what he did, he said, he said, I'm doing it. And he said, it's because of the grace of God that is empowering me and keeping me. And he'll do the same for you. The same Holy Ghost that Paul had, you have. So your future is bright. I said, your future is bright. Things can change in a hurry. You know, God can, can do some things in a second that people said was impossible. I'm telling you what, if you will get in the Word and you will do just like what Abraham did in Romans chapter 4. He said he, he grew strong in his faith, giving glory to God. What I've seen, if you start to rejoice in what Jesus has done for you, if you just say you take Ephesians chapter 2, and you start from verse 4, you said, But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved. Through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works, does anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand for you to walk in. There's some things that God has prepared for you before you were even born, because He knew about you. He knew that you would be here right now. Those things is what you are going to walk in. If you will start to just rejoice in those things, it won't take long until the Holy Ghost starts to reveal to you. What that looks like for you. What that looks like for your future. You know, he's the spirit of truth. He will take hold with the word of God and reveal it to you. And now faith rises in your heart. Faith rises in your heart. And now you start to speak some things out of your life in accordance with the word of God. And things start to change. Praise the Lord. That was the second sermon, I guess, but... Anyhow, I just want to encourage you, and then, you know, we have to leave. And so I just want to get in, you know, what I can to, to, to encourage you. Get the word in your mouth. 
become a God pilot to understand how these things work. You know, speak the Ephesians prayers over yourself in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3 every day. Ask God for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, in the knowledge of Jesus. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what he called you for. In, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, he says, I strive to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. He laid hold of you for something. It's not just for you to be ordinary. He never made anybody to be ordinary. He made every Christian to be exceptional. And that's you. To be over and above, to the point that people look at you and say, how could they do that? In your workplace, be stand apart so much that people are like, wow, I've never seen anybody do business like that. You remember Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon, you know, her breath. She, she, her breath was taken away because of the excellence of how we did things. That can be the same for you. The excellence of how you do business. The excellence of how you do your job. Did you know that God, he, he anointed people in the Old Testament to work with their hands? Did you know that? Bezalel and Aholiab. Those, those names are so that you can't even forget them if you even try. God anointed them to work in precious stones and in gold and stuff like that for the temple. So God will anoint you to do what you're called to do so that you are over and above. Over and above. Over and above. Energy, life about you, joy about you. That's what God wants for you. And you saying the right things will really help you tap into that. And I have to quit. Praise the Lord.